Hi, SQL folks. Let's talk about resource wait time. Now, this DMV is quite popular, says DMOS wait stats. We all know that we analyze wait statistics data with the help of this DMV. If you run a simple select star from this DMV and order by wait time milliseconds descending, you will be able to see the top weights uh, in your SQL Server environment. Of course, this is not the kind of query you would run. You would probably run a more detailed version of this query with a lot of mathematics and you may want to filter out a lot of system weight types. But today's content is about identifying the exact, the accurate resource wait time. Now, what do I mean by the resource wait time? I was having a discussion with a few DBAs in the community and I kind of figured out that there is a bit of lack of clarity on the, on the numbers that you see from this uh, DMV. So if you look carefully here, there are important attributes and most importantly, the wait time in milliseconds and the signal wait time. Now let's first understand what is signal wait time. Now signal wait time, these numbers here represent the amount of time the thread has spent in the runnable queue of the CPU. Now think about the CPU, the virtual processor, and I'm going to simplify it. A thread is the lowest unit of execution and it is running your query. So either it is running, which means it's doing its job on the CPU, that's the running status of the thread. And when it encounters a wait, let's say it is waiting for a resource, it is moved off the CPU into the waiter list. That's when the thread is suspended. So that is the suspended state. So what has happened is from running, the thread has moved to suspended state. Now, let's say the thread gets access to the resource it was waiting for, and now it is ready to run. When it is ready to run, it goes back to the CPU, but maybe the CPU is not available. CPU is probably serving other threads. So the thread, this thread, which is now ready to run, has to wait in something what we call as the runnable queue. Each virtual processor in your SQL Server OS environment maintains a runnable queue, which is like first in, first out. And the thread which is now ready to run has to go and line up, has to queue itself up at the end of the queue. This is the runnable queue. Signal wait time represent that number, the time that the thread spends in the runnable queue. So from the time it was signaled to run until the time it started running. That is what signal wait time represents. Now, what is wait time? Wait time is actually a sum of waiting for the resource as well as signal wait time. This is the clarity which I wanted to share with you through this video. Now, the resource wait time is actually the time the thread is spending in the waiter list, you know, waiting to get access to the resource. That's the resource wait time. But unfortunately, this DMV does not give you the resource wait time straightforwardly, like the way you get the wait time and the signal wait time. It does not have a specific attribute for resource wait time. So you got to compute the resource wait time and the mathematics for that is very, very straightforward. It is simply the wait time minus the signal wait time, right? So I repeat that again. Here, if you look at the query, wait time minus signal wait time. So you're just subtracting the signal wait time from wait time. Wait time is the sum of resource wait time and signal wait time that will give you the resource wait time. Why is this resource wait time important? I mean, why not just simply focus on wait time and get your job done? This is, which is what I really see with many DBAs and when they are analyzing the wait stats data, they're just looking at the wait time there. Well, that is okay, but probably you got to fine tune how you are analyzing and you got to be very accurate when you're dealing with SQL Server and you know, you're doing all this performance tuning stuff. A high wait time with respect to signal wait time, or in simple words, high signal wait time would could probably mean that there is a CPU pressure. You just cannot ignore signal wait time. When you are looking at wait time, you go also got to keep an eye on the signal wait time. So in simple words, you need to first compute resource wait time. Like if you see the example here, where I do a select top 10 wait, etc. And uh, you get the wait time. 
I am computing the resource wait time with this simple arithmetic which I just talked about wait time minus signal wait time and then you get signal wait time and whatnot. So let's just go and simply run this. Now if you see here this is what you need to do when you look at the of course this uh, you got to filter out many more system wait types I understand that don't bother about that just let's understand the numbers. So you got to compute the resource wait time. That is step number one. Step number two is this is your total wait time here. So when you see the resource wait time and the signal wait time, if signal wait time is very low, negligible, it's all good. You can just focus on the resource wait time. But if signal wait time is also high, you know, maybe, uh, unlikely close to the uh, to the resource wait time but it's 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 quite significant if the number is high it's it's a good number then you got to also look into cpu troubleshooting you got to monitor and understand the cpu pressure you got to look into the uh, uh, let's say the runnable queue of the cpu because it's just not the thread is waiting for the resource the thread is also spending considerable amount of time in the runnable queue so you got to look at both these numbers. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly summarize. Just don't look at wait time in milliseconds. Yes, you have that number, compute the resource wait time and keep an eye on the signal wait time. If resource wait time is very high, signal wait time is low, okay, just focus on that resource bottleneck, that's all good. But if signal wait time is also high, along with resource wait time, then you also got to look into CPU troubleshooting. I will explain this to you with a demonstration, a very simple demonstration because just before recording the video, I was trying to play around a few things and I just came up with something to show you how this entire thing works. Okay, so let's do this simple demonstration. I am first going to, I'll just do this one. Yeah, this is pretty decent. Let's look at LCKMS, okay? So I'm going to get you some numbers from wait stats and I'm going to fi uh, filter on the wait type lock mode shared. This simply means it will show me the weights related to um, a thread when it is waiting to access a shared lock on a page. Right now, all the numbers are reset to zero. So I'm just for the purpose of this demo, let me clear off, let me reset the wait stats once more. And let's look at the number here. So everything is all zero. Now, you are going to see wait time in milliseconds here, and you're going to see signal wait time. When SQL Server is quiescent, you know, there are not too many workloads running, which means SQL Server is uh, under really no pressure, right? I mean, the runnable queue, in other words, the runnable queue of each CPU is probably empty. So let's jump over to this window. And from SysDMOS schedulers, I can extract the runnable task count. So if I execute this now, you will see that my VM here has eight virtual processors and the runnable task count, which means how many tasks I have in the runnable queue for each CPU. It's all zero because there's really nothing running right now. Okay. This is also a way to kind of identify what is going on with each CPU on your box. Now I am going to create a very simple uh, situation here. I am going to run a uh, an update statement in a while loop. Let's do that here. Okay, first let me see if uh, there's anything running already. Okay, there was a few things. Okay, now I am going to run this in a while loop and I am going to run a select statement in a while loop. Okay, what is this going to do? This is going to create a LCKMS wait type, just trying to simulate a, a blocking scenario here. And let's see some numbers. Now, the moment you run this, let's see, let's just wait for a few seconds. So you will see some numbers coming up. Okay. Numbers are very, very low. So if numbers are low, what we could do is the easiest thing we could do is let's just stop this and introduce some delay here. Okay, let's introduce some delay. We have stopped both the queries. I mean, this is what we keep doing in demos, typical trial and errors. Okay, so now with some delays, let's give this another try. Okay, just to get some more numbers. Okay, there you go. 
Okay, let's jump back. And while they are running in a in an endless loop, let's look at, okay, now we see some numbers. Now, if you see the waiting task counts and wait time in milliseconds, at least you're getting some numbers out there, all good. But you will see that signal wait time is still zero. When these two, two threads are running, like two users, one is constantly updating and the other one is constantly selecting, and you have eight virtual processors, it's still a very quiet environment in SQL Server here. If you go and check the DimOS schedulers, you will see the runnable task count is all zero, right? Which means our threads, when they get access to the resource, they are really not waiting. They're not really spending any time in the runnable queue because there's no one ahead of them in the runnable queue which means when a thread is waiting, it goes to the waiter list, it gets access to the re resource and it immediately starts running and is spending no time in the runnable queue. And that is why for when you are analyzing the wait stats here for LCK MS wait type, because the system is right now under no pressure at all, there is really no signal wait time at all. So you can just see that number two coming up from somewhere, but otherwise, there's absolutely negligible signal wait time. I hope this is all well understood. Two threads, one of them is waiting, waits, uh, goes, uh, waits for the data page, the select query, goes to the waiter list, waits for whatever minimal time, gets access to the data page, goes to the runnable queue, but there's no one in the runnable queue and instantly gets its turn on the CPU. Then a moment comes when again it has to wait for the resource because it's a while loop and that cycle keeps happening. The point of this demo here is there's no signal wait time, literally negligible, all good. Now the workload is continues to run and you can see wait time is going up high as we speak and as as time passes by, you will see wait time going up, waiting task count goes up, signal wait time is just still hovering around a single digit number there. Now we are going to stress SQL Server with more users. Before we do that, I will just show you uh, OS schedulers once more and you will see a runnable task count is all zero here. Okay, now I will go back to our masterclass content here and stress CPU. So I am going to pick up one of the examples there, which one do I do? Let me just, uh, let me just look at the query, which one are we picking up? Okay, so what we can do here is, let's run this one. This is going to create a lot of threads now, right? And we are stressing SQL Server. And the first thing I will show you now is the runnable task count. And there you go, the moment you have hundreds of users hitting SQL Server, you will see that they're all distributed across the eight virtual processors we have. Now we have stress on SQL Server. Now you have a lot of threads and probably the CPUs are not able to keep up with this, these, the, uh, this incoming request and the runnable queue has a lot of threads now waiting. Now when this is happening, our threads also, the previous two threads, the one that was updating and the other one that was selecting, specifically selecting because the LCKMS wait type, that class was registered by the select query, even that is waiting in the runnable queue to get its turn on the CPU. Maybe the wait time is negligible, but it is still something which you need to be aware of. While this is happening, I want to show you that if you look into the task manager, the last few seconds of this execution, you will uh, observe, let's go to the performance tab there. And, oh, it wasn't on. This is done, okay, in 30 seconds. Let's close this and run this once more. So the entire execution took about 30 seconds to run. And just watch the CPU graph now for all the eight virtual processors. Now when you're stressing SQL Server, look at all the eight virtual processors. They have a lot of work to do and they have threads waiting in the runnable queue. And the point here is our select query, which is constantly encountering the LCKMS wait type, when it gets access to the resource, that is the resource wait time, but then it has to spend some amount of time in the runnable queue before it gets its turn, which means there will be some signal wait time, okay? We are done with this, let's close this, jump back here, and now let's come to the conclusion of today's content. 
So before we stressed SQL Server, signal wait time was just three. And I think this number will be slightly, will, will be something now. Let's go and execute this. Okay, and you can see some signal wait time popping up now. There you go. Still negligible, but at least you get the message. And the point that I'm trying to make is when you are looking at wait time, keep an eye on the signal wait time also. And never, never just look at the wait time. The easiest thing to do is compute the resource wait time in all your scripts and analysis. Simple mathematics will get you the resource wait time. This is the accurate wait time related to the resource for which the query was waiting. All right, friends, and of course, please take care of the numbers like casting, conversion, and all of that so that you don't get the divide by zero errors and, and all of that stuff. All right, hopefully the video was useful. If you like these kind of this kind of content and you know performance tuning stuff and other videos in our YouTube channel, and you want to dive deeper into SQL Server performance tuning subject, do take a look at the masterclass content on sqlmaestros.com. There are three things that you may want to focus on. First, the all-in-one bundle. The second one, masterclass recordings, 40 hours. There are a couple of them focus on the 40 hours. And the third one is the live class. Once in a year, I do a performance tuning live class, which gets recorded and that is available as the 40 hours recording class. All right, friends, that is anything, whether you take up the recordings or the live class, you get lifetime subscription. Anything that you subscribe to the learning solution, you get lifetime subscription. And friends, it does take a while before you become a performance tuning expert. Do not go for those annual subscriptions or biannual subscriptions. There are a lot of people on the internet trying to sell SQL Server learning solutions or video courses, essentials, fundamentals, mastering, beginners, advanced, and 15, 20, 30s of them, so many. I mean, query tuning basics, advanced tuning, and whatnot. You really don't need to go uh, with dozens of such SQL courses, never ever. You just need this one performance tuning masterclass recording 40 hours deep dive content from start to finish and you get lifetime subscription, which means you can watch the content anytime, anywhere, as many times as you want. Because with just with an annual subscription, your objective is not going to be fulfilled. You're going to work with SQL Server for a couple of months and years. And when you're learning and working, you need reference material. You want to go back to those videos again and again and watch them and practice all the script samples and demos. Anyway, a lot of uh, talking and advising here. Hop on to sqlmaestros.com and explore everything by yourself. And I will see you soon in another video. Happy SQL! Thank you.